Hi guys, in today's discussion of How I Became a Hindu by Sitaram Goel, we discuss Sitaram Goel's tryst with a father, a reverend, who tries to convert him to Christianity. Now you have to remember that you must always be aware of nice people. People, not, not a ra- random stranger being nice to you, but someone you already know for a few days or months, who's, who's kind of close to you, but that, such a person being nice to you all the, all the, all the time, uh, and the entire day, every time you speak to that person, you are always having nice conversations. That's a little fishy uh, because you are always going to have some disagreements, some quarrels with, with anyone you are close to. How else are you going to, uh, how else is that a normal relationship? So if someone's nice all the time, that means they are hiding some of their evils behind that nice niceness. Unless they are a complete stranger and you say hi to them in, on the road. But here we see a nice person trying to do something nice for Sitaram Goel uh, and he is not coming with some uh, some vicious intentions. It is a vicious intention but uh, I don't think even the father knows that. He thinks he is just being nice and saving Sitaram Goel but that's not the case as we know it as Indians. It was at this time that I fell seriously ill and lost a lot of weight which I had never had in plenty. A Catholic missionary whom I had known earlier in connection with our anti-communist work came to visit me. He was a good and kindly man and had a strong character. He had insisted upon his religious right to sell our anti-communist literature in melas and exhibitions in spite of his mission's advice that this was no part of his ordained work uh, and that in any case the government of India frowned upon it. The father, as I called him, found me in a difficult condition physically as well as financially. He felt sure that it was in such times that Jesus Christ came to people. He asked me if I was prepared to receive Jesus. I did not understand immediately that he was inviting me to get converted to Catholicism. My impression was that he wanted to help me with some spiritual exercises prescribed by Christianity. Moreover, I had always admired Jesus. I had therefore no objection to receiving him. Remember that Jesus might be called the first social uh, first socialist in human history the second historical figure to be socialist might be ashoka i had therefore no objection to receiving him i mentioned that because uh, since sitaram goel used to be a communist he was some at some point a social a socialist so in that case as a as a personality wise he might not have had any disagreements or, or qualms with what jesus christ taught Moreover, I had always admired Jesus, I had therefore no objection to receiving him. Only I was doubtful if someone was really in a position to arrange the meeting. But I became aware of the father's true intentions as I travelled with him to a distant monastery. He asked every other missionary he met on the way to pray for his success. At this monastery, which was a vast place with very picturesque surroundings, I was advised by the father to go into a retreat. It meant my solitary confinement to a room. I was not supposed to look at or talk to anyone on my way to the bathroom or while taking my morning and evening strolls on the extensive lawns outside. And I was to meditate on themes which the father prescribed for me in the course of four or five lectures he delivered to me during the course of the day, starting at about 6.30 in those winter mornings. I was not uh, not used to this way of life. I had never lived in such solitude by my own choice. My only solace was that I was allowed to smoke and provided with plenty of books on the Christian creed and theology. I tried to read some of the books, but I failed to finish any one of them. They were full of biblical themes and theological terminology which, uh, with which I was not familiar. Many of the time they made me recall Ram Swarup's observation about mere cerebration, as we have discussed in a previous video. Or they were simplistic harangues to love Christ and join the Catholic Church. They had a close similarity to communist pamphlets, which I had read in plenty. The father had asked me again and again to invoke Christ and meditate upon him, but he had not told me how to do it. I had no previous practice in meditation. I did not know how to invoke Christ, or any other Godhead for that matter. All I could do was to think again and again of Christian preaching the sermon, Christ preaching the sermon on the mount or saving an adulteress from being stoned to death, but my thoughts would wander away after every few minutes, for a few moments. The father asked me before the start of every new lesson if I was feeling drawn towards Christ. 
In my exasperation, I told him on the evening of the second day that the only deity towards whom I was feeling drawn was Sri Krishna. This was not true. I had told a lie for which I felt ashamed immediately after. I had felt drawn towards nothing, far less Sri Krishna. Most of the time my mind was busy in free association in the Freudian sense. I told the lie because by now I was fed up with the father's lectures. They had no relevance to any of the problems with which I was faced. I wanted the father to frown at the mention of Sri Krishna and say something unkind about him so that I could pick up an argument, defy the discipline he had imposed on me and get out of his clutches. But the father did not frown. Nor did he say anything unkind about Sri Krishna. He became thoughtful, almost pensive. He told me at last that in his long experience of conversions, Jesus had never tarried so long. He asked me to make another attempt that night. I promised. But I went to sleep immediately after he left. I was dead tired. Little did I know that my release from that prison was to come about next morning. While delivering a lecture on creation, the father said that God in his wisdom and kindness had made all these fishes and animals and birds for man's consumption. I immediately rose in revolt. I told him very empathetically that I was a Vaishnava and a vegetarian and that I had absolutely no use for a God that bestowed upon man the right to kill and eat his other creatures simply because man happened to be stronger and more skilled. I added that in my opinion it was the duty of the strong and the more skilled to protect the weaker and the less wily. The father also suddenly lost his self-position. He almost shouted, I can never understand you Hindus who go about seeing a soul in every lice and bug and cockroach that crawls around you. The Bible says in so many words that, it's, that man is God's highest creation. What is wrong with the higher, higher lording over the lower? I kept quiet. I could see the pain in his eyes. I did not want to add to his anguish. He recovered his self-possession very soon and smiled. Now I went down on my knees before him and asked his forgiveness for my lack of strength to go on with the retreat. He agreed, although rather reluctantly. His sense of failure was writ large on his face. I was very sorry indeed. I now wish that it would have been better for both of us if Christ had come to me. On our way back to the big city where his mission was housed, he became his old normal self again. There was not a trace of bitterness on his face or in his voice as we talked and joked and discussed several serious and not so serious matters. Now I took my courage in both my hands and asked him my final question. Father, am I not already a Christian? I do not normally tell a lie. I do not steal. I do not bear false witness. I do not covet my neighbor's wife or property. What more can a man do to demand God's grace and kinship with Christ? Why should you insist on a formal conversion which in no way helps me to become better than what I am? His reply was very positive and it estranged me from the Christian creed for good. He said, it is an illusion that you can become a Christian if you practice Christian virtues. One cannot claim to be virtuous unless one is baptized in the Church of Christ. He is the only Saviour. No one outside his fold can claim salvation. The only thing the heathens can look forward to is eternal hellfire. That evening I had a chat with the librarian in the mission library. He was young but looked very sad and far away. His surname was Hindu but he told me that he had become a Christian a few years ago. He continued, I fell seriously ill. There was no money in the house. I was earning a small salary and had had a wife and two children to support. My relatives were also poor like me and could not help much. What with the cost of such medicines and a prescribed diet? It was at this moment that the father appeared on the scene. I had known him earlier as he frequented our street in search of converts. He brought all the medicines and fruits for me. I was very grateful to him. And one day in a moment of my mental weakness, he baptized me. My wife refused to become a Christian. She was an Orthodox Hindu, but she did not desert me. After I had regained my health, the father insisted that my conversion was not complete unless I ate beef. As a Kayastha, I was already a non-vegetarian. I saw no great harm in eating yet another type of meat. But as soon as my wife learned of it, she left with our two children and went away to her father's place in another town. I went after her, but I was turned out of their house. I have been excommunicated. No one in my community or amongst my relatives will share with me so much as a glass of water. I have nowhere to go. This mission is my only refuge till I die. 
Now Sitaram Goel writes, I was reminded of Vivekananda's description of Christianity as churchianity. At the same time, I was ashamed of the society to which I belonged. For ages past, this society had perfected the art of losing its limbs, one after another. But what could I do for that young man? I was myself in search of a refuge in the physical as well as the ideological sense.